Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mott's House Games Podcast. My name is Delton. I'll be your host today. And with me, as usual, is my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. Howdy, howdy, howdy. This is the Malt House Games Podcast. We are a podcast all about board games, card games, role-playing games, tabletop games, dice games, things of that sort, and beer. What do we have today, Delty Poo? We have, you caught me right before I cracked it, uh, we have Groundhog's Shadow, a hazelnut brown ale from Canadian River Brewing Co., our first beer of Canadian River Brewing Co., I think in general, in life, as well as the podcast. Yeah, so we went to go shop for beers the other night for the podcast, and I was really craving a brown ale. And I haven't found a good brown ale since Rogue's, uh, brown ale, what was it, Rogue's? Uh, yeah, the, Rogue has a like a just brown like a, ale, but it's like a hazelnut. It's like a hazelnut brown ale. Yeah. And they changed the formula probably about four or five years ago. And Further back than that. Yeah, it's, it's not the same. So I really have been craving like that old brown ale from like 2014 when I first discovered brown ales. And so uh, Delty was meandering around the liquor store and found this bad boy from Chickasha, America. Yes, this is out of Chickasha, Oklahoma. It says the Groundhog's Shadow features a medium body and a distinctive deep brown color. Brewed with Cascade and hopped with Chinook to capture an aroma of slight evergreen and pine complemented by the richness of a roasted hazelnut. So it sounds like exactly what we're wanting. Let's go. And as you know, I, for some reason, love me some of the really piney flavored hops. So hopefully this does not disappoint. It's going to make me want to run into the forest even quicker than tomorrow. Why is that? Because we're going hiking tomorrow. Oh my God. Finally, first hike of the year. Our first two hiking adventures got froze out because the first time we tried to go hiking, it was a, what, a negative two degrees or something like that for the entire weekend. That was the high? Yep. And then the second hiking adventure that we had planned, we got snowed out. It was a snowpocalypse that weekend. One of, like, three that we get every year in Oklahoma landed on that weekend. Oh, what is that face? I think you're going to like this beer. Oh, I'm excited. I think you're going to like it. Oh. It's extremely dark. You can't, There's not much light coming through that, just around the edges of the glass. That smells dark and delicious. It's got a very nice, rich smell to it. Mm-hmm. Give it a taste, Haley. That way I can entertain our listeners while you take a drinky mm-hmm. drink. How is it? Oh, man. I think this beats the, the Rogue Hazelnut Brown 100%. Oh, oh, that's smooth. Oh, it's smooth. It's rich, but not overly so. It's almost crisp. It has a nice full mouthfeel, but it does have a bit of crispness at the end. It's like the carbonation's just right. It doesn't have an oily lingering at all. It tastes like I've eaten a handful of hazelnuts. I've had like Ferrero Rocher's for the last 30 minutes is what the aftertaste tastes like. It does have, oh, that's a really good brown. Oh, man. Okay, Canadian River coming out strong with Groundhog's Shadow. 10 out of 10, Canadian River. Mm. I don't know where you are exactly in Chickasha, but... I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you, girl. No one does, because no one's been to Chickasha. (laughs) I'm sure I have at some point. I don't think I have, but I'm sure I have at some point. I know it's my mom. was like a kid. Moved in the fourth grade, so I know it exists. At least the legend exists in my family's lore. Uh, I I never said this. Alcohol is 6.7% by volume, and it is a a 12-fluid ounce can. The IBUs are only in a very low 23.6. The Canadian River just become my favorite brewery. Do we just I, become best friends? It's, it's going to be hard. They're gonna, we're going to have to try a lot more of their stuff. We really oh, need that's to, good. We really need to do like a video series or something where we legitimately go to all these breweries and like just take some videos of the breweries themselves and some of the beers and me and you go and try them and have like a whole thing. I think that, that would be, be fun at some point, but that just means I got to go buy a bunch of beer. Also means we have to go down to Duncan to Cockendorfer too because they're, yeah. they're high up there as well. Luckily, we've already been to a Broken Bow, to uh, Mountain Fork. Mm-hmm. However, I would happily go back to Broken Bow to do some hiking as well if it means we have to go to Mountain Fork, you know, then that's, that's fine because then we get to hike. So, Man, are yeah. we just manifesting a Patreon-only video series right now? Because I don't want to make any promises, but I kind of want to make these promises to ourselves. This sounds I'm, dope. I am making zero promises because I know myself. I want to manifest it, though. <laughs> manifesting 2024 goals of going hiking, trying these breweries in obscure Oklahoma towns like Chickasha, America, and just having a good time. Yeah, we have to go to the one in Clinton again. Hell yeah, Long uh, Longview. Long Bell. Long Bell. Long Bell. They had some good stuff. I can't remember which beer it was I liked the most there. We tried a lot of beers that day. We did. We tried several. But yeah, so there's a a nice new beer for the podcast, which is great. 
Uh, since the last episode, me and Kyle went to the Tool concert because Kyle got us tickets, me and him, for Christmas, which was very kind of him. And it was great, as I expected. I saw Tool in either 2009 or 10 when they came to Oklahoma City and have not got to see them since. And finally got, this will honestly probably be the last time I get to see them, I would imagine. Uh, I don't know how long they'll do a tour and stay together. Oh, that's a great question. But they might be working on a new album, so I don't know. But anyway, that was fantastic, getting to see one of my all-time favorite drummers. I'm going to say probably, he's probably number two. Danny Carey is after Gavin Harrison? Yeah, Gavin Harrison from Porcupine Tree is my favorite. And I think Danny Carey is my solid number two. And then Portnoy. Portnoy is in the top ten. I don't know how high up he is anymore. Whoa. I still enjoy him. I learned a lot. But if I'm going to look to, to somebody for inspiration, he's not my first like five choices probably. But also, I usually just stick with Gavin Harrison and don't <laughs> move past that very often. But anyway, we got I got to do that, which was very fun. Uh, me and Haley got tattoos. We had our tat our like you know semi annual tattoo appointment. Yeah, so I got mine colored in. So I don't know if I mentioned this on the podcast, but about six months ago, I got a tattoo that was dedicated to Steve. I got the outline done. It is Steve as a Soviet cosmonaut. And so it's, it was drawn in the same fashion as Soviet Union propaganda posters. It was on my leg, and I got it colored in this last week, and it looks amazing. As it soon looks as, so good. As soon as it doesn't look like lizard skin, I will post pictures on the interwebs. But right now, the first picture we took looked really bloody, and the, any pictures I would have taken subsequently will look like lizard skin. So we're going to give it a couple more weeks, and it'll make its grand debut. Yes, uh, for anybody who is unfamiliar, Steve was one of our precious kitty cats who passed away last year. He was our very first kitty cat we got together. We had him for almost 10 years. He was nine, wasn't he? He was nine, yeah. Yep, and was it last March? It was April. April. I keep forgetting when exactly it was, but yes. So that's Haley's tattoo was her kind of memoriam tattoo for him. I will get something at some point. I already have an idea. It just comes down to what am I doing and when, because my next appointment in June... We'll be coloring in. I got, uh, so I've started on my horror tattoos and I have my Evil Dead one done. And now this is my Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I got all the black outline and stuff done and I'll do the color in June. So maybe after that, I'll do my Steve tattoo. We'll see. I have a lot of ideas. I need a lot more money and time. So that's how that goes. We did that. What else have we done? So we went and had a game day with Brian and Jessica. We did. That was really fun. I won the first game. You did win the first game, but that was it. That no. <laughs> I don't remember who won what or what we played. I, I won the uh the block party oh. game. Yes, yes, yes. We played block party from Big Potato, a very goofy but fun game. I think it's uh, as Big Potato does. They take family weight, easy to learn, fun to play, and they do really well with it. So that was an easy party game that I'll definitely be picking up for my niece at some point. Our niece. Yes. We did that this week, and then we really had a, a fairly chill week. Our Valentine's Day was very low key. We kind of yeah. uh, we did Valentine's Day in like three different parts, and so we exchanged gifts over last weekend, which we'll get to at the end of the episode. On Wednesday, we made some Asian food, had some sake, and just kind of spent the evening together. And then today, we went out and about and just had kind of a date day. We got lunch at Jinya Gin- Ramen. Is that right? Uh, Jinya Ramen. Yeah, Jinya Ramen, and then we. Went to some antique stores, went yeah. to a music store, bought yeah. some guitar picks, got a really dope Red Hot Chili Peppers promo from Japan. It has yes. a list of their albums that you could buy and also a list of their tour dates from 2002 Yep, all across Japan. We got that for six bucks, and I was excited about that. They have a little section. It's this uh, store called Gear Exchange, OKC. Little bitty store packed to the brim. They have to take advantage of the vertical space, and they do. But they have this section of like autographed pictures and, you know, special tour promos or posters or whatever. And we saw this. It's the Red Hot Chili Peppers in Japanese. And I was like, this is sick. We flipped it over and it's like, okay, all their albums and there's the dates of these albums. It's all around the 2002 and before. And I was like, okay, so it's early 2000s. Well, it didn't have a price. None of the like concert posters did. So Haley takes it to the front. We're going to buy her a pack of guitar picks. And she was like, how much are you guys asking for this? And the guy was like, oh, I don't know. Does it not have a price? We're like, no. So he's like, what about the rest of them? We were like, no, we looked. Haley went back and looked again. He was like, I don't know. What's it worth? And Haley was like, well, I, I'm not sure. It was just, you know, just kind of cool. And he was like, oh, uh, I don't know. Six bucks sound okay? We were like, yup. <laughs> <laughs> Ended up being like 45 bucks online. I felt bad after. This was after we paid for it. We got in the car and we're like, how much does this thing run? 
like forty five dollars. I'm like, well, we got a steal. That's at least the asking on eBay, right? Yeah, it's at least the ask. Well, it wasn't on eBay. It was on some other ah. like store or whatever yeah but that was really cool to get and i was excited about that we both are so we're gonna frame that and throw it on the wall of cool stuff in the dining room hell yeah brother uh i think that's really most of what we did today it was a really nice day just a really Mm -hmm. great day meandering delton got a massage i did some studying got some coffee got some ramen got some cool stuff yeah and now we're here presenting you with the best board game review of all time oh here's the door It's straight ahead. It's it's a game. So the game for this episode is one I bought for Haley. For me. Wh- when? Uh, 2022's Christmas? Dece- yeah. So a little over a year ago. <laughs> I got her this on the P500 system through GMT. Uh, GMT Games, if you do not know, makes almost exclusively historical games. A lot of war games or war... Uh, seeming games, I guess. They're based around wars, whether they're an official war game or not. Depends on how you look at that terminology and how into war games you are. But GMT has a system called the P500. You can imagine it like Kickstarter, kind of. Once they get 500 or more people saying they will buy this game, uh, it's going to be at a discount. Then they will finalize all the stuff. They'll get the art and development done. They'll send it to the printers. And once it's ready, they will then charge the card for the game and shipping and then they will send the game out as soon as it's done. I love their P500 system, except their emails saying they're going to charge you are almost always late or right on the day that they're charging. Uh, At least for me, that's annoying. However, you can get really good games for a good discount, and I love that, especially because they do the P500 even for their reprints. So if you want the the fourth reprint that has all the rulebook updates and everything, sign up for the P500, and then, you know, blah, 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 you get your game. And so I'm, I am signed up to several right now. I think only one of which I'm going to have to worry about in the next few months actually charging. But we'll see if it gets there and when it does. So the game for today I got from that for Haley Forever Ago. This is Twilight Struggle, Red Sea, Conflict in the Horn of Africa. And it was great. End of review. So Told twi- you, best review ever. It was great. Buy it now. Sure. 10-minute game, Twilight Struggle. Not 10 10 out minute. of 10. A 10-minute game. So twi- <laughs> Twilight Struggle, Red Sea is part of what they call their lunchtime series, which are games that are supposed to be able to be played within your one-hour lunch from set up, play, and tear down. I think you have to know the games pretty well, at least in terms of this one. I don't know. We played the first one in 10 minutes. We'll talk about that, ass. (laughs) Uh, The second one was a little over an hour, but I will say for a game that the box says 35 minutes, for a Twilight Struggle game that says 35 minutes to go an hour, hour 10, is far better than the full Twilight Struggle that says, you know, an hour and a half to two hour game that's going to run three to four hours. I will take an hour long game over a three hour game of Twilight Struggle. It doesn't feel as bad to I me. I mean, 10 minutes, and like an hour, 10 minutes kind of balances out to that hey, 35 will or you so. you shut up for a minute? Uh, okay, she's a jerk, everybody, <laughs> a jerk. And I'll explain why shortly. So Twilight Struggle Red Sea Conflict in the Horn of Africa. We're just going to call this Twilight Struggle Red Sea. It is. Oh, you know, if I actually had the credits pulled up, where the hell? Why are there two rule books? So the credits. GMT games. It the, yes, there you know there is that. I it's it's fine. The credits are in the uh, solo and background booklet. So this game does have a solo version implemented, and in the solo booklet, there's also background to the cards as well as designer notes, solo designer notes, and the credits. Uh, The credits, the game design is Jason Matthews. He is the same designer behind Twilight Struggle, and I believe he's part of Campaign Manager 2008. And I want to say he's one of the designers of A Distant Plane? Is that the one that's the War on Terror 2001? No. What's that game called? Labyrinth. Yes, Labyrinth Labyrinth, War on Terror. I believe he's one of the designers on Labyrinth. I want to say Ananda Gupta is the second designer with Twilight Struggle and on Labyrinth. But Jason Matthews does a bunch of these similar style games. Uh, Development is Bruce Wigdor, Jason Carr, who Jason Carr also did the solo system in this game, and Ananda Gupta for the Twilight Struggle system. Graphics by Terry Leeds, rule booklet by James Hebert, production coordinator Tony Curtis, and as I said, published by GMT Games. So Twilight Struggle, Red Sea, if you have played the full Twilight Struggle, you know how to play this game. The only difference is going to be two countries are considered flashpoint countries. Those are Ethiopia and Somalia. 
I believe, was the other one, correct? Yes. Uh, Flashpoint countries just have a slightly different rule when it comes to performing a coup, and there is an instant game win that involves the two Flashpoint countries. But the game itself is going to be the same. On your turn, you are... I'm going to skip over the headline card and all that, but essentially it's a card-based game with a board where you are trying to have more control on the map than your opponent. On your turn, you can play a card either for the event, if that event is yours, or one that could be for either opponent, because one player is USSR, one is US. And then uh, you can either play the event that is good for you or good for both of you, which means you get to play it for you. Or you can play the card for its operation value, which gives you the option to either put influence in different uh, countries and stuff, try to perform a coup in a country, or a realignment role in a country. Uh, if you play a card for its operation value, if the event is either usable by both players or is your opponent's event, they get to trigger it no matter what if you use the card for operation value, which is where a lot of the strategy within Twilight Struggle, frustratingly so for me, comes into play. So if I play one of Haley's Soviet, Haley's Soviet cards for three operation value, She's going to get to do the event on it, but luckily I get to choose when she does it. Usually that's going to be before I perform whatever I'm going to do with those operation points based on a couple other factors. You're going to do that and be vying for control, at least in Red Sea. You're going to be vying for control over Africa and the Middle East, at least parts of each. Egypt is considered part of both of those regions. And then there is also the special, like, sea space in this one, strategic sea lanes. It's essentially the Suez Canal is how I'm... Is that actually on the map where it's yes. located too? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's also that location, which can provide different benefits. But the game is going to play out in that manner of playing cards, taking actions, doing things like that. There are two turns in the game. The turns are consisting of seven rounds per player. So round one, Haley will get to go as USSR. I get to go as US. Round two, you do it again. Around three, four, five, six, seven. And then we do the end of round kind of cleanup, move, or end of turn cleanup, move to turn two, which is the late war. Shuffle some cards in, deal some more cards out. And then we're both going to get seven actions, uh, depending on what the cards played are. And that's going to be the game. Now, the game does have a point system. It, it is a direct like teeter-totter of points. If I have two points, that means Haley has technically negative two. It's two to my direction. If Haley gains one point, it takes my two and makes it only one point for me. And if she ends up taking four points from there, then she would have a positive three points. Works in that manner. There are other ways the game can end, though. Not only could it be getting to the end and having points, or the most points, which is how I won the second game, surprisingly, it can also be that somebody has triggered nuclear war by the DEFCON status going all the way to nuclear war. Whoever is the, they call it the phasing player, the active player, they lose the game if it is triggered, so you have to be careful on what you're playing because if your opponent has an event that they can use to lower that DEFCON status, but it was your card with the event on it that you played, then it's going to be your fault, which means you will lose. You can also hit your maximum point value if at any point in the game, all, with one exception, if at any point in the game you hit 10 points, which is the max in this, you immediately win and your opponent just loses. Then there is another one, one that I was unaware of and didn't understand the true implications of how it would happen and what would happen during it. But Haley beat me in the first 10 freaking minutes on like the second or third card because during the Africa scoring card, uh, there is actually a card to score Africa during the turn itself rather than just at the end of the game. There's also one for the Middle East that comes out in the late war deck, I believe. But on the Africa scoring card, when you do that scoring, I want to say it's if you control both Ethiopia and Somalia. And a battleground. And the battleground, one of the two battleground countries, mm -hmm. which is Egypt and whatever the other one was. Kenya, I think. Yes, and Kenya, you automatically win the game. Guess who automatically won, won the game? So that sucked. Uh, it was one of those moments where I saw what Haley was doing, and I was like, ah, she's got both these Flashpoint countries. I don't know what that means. I haven't played this before. And I'm like, oh, you got the Africa scoring card, don't you? You're just trying to get more stuff so you can make some points right here by playing it. Well, that's me not understanding how she could auto-win with that card. 
So I don't do anything about it. And then she plays it and boom, she won. And in that moment, I tell you, I wanted to just put this game in the trash can, (laughs) which is usually how most games of Twilight Struggle end up for me. I felt so bad, but also I didn't. Well, it's one of those things that I taught the game and I talked about it, but I didn't understand how that looked when it happened. And neither did you, right? You saw the card and said, oh, okay, I can make this happen. See, I kept waiting for Dalton to intervene because I kept asking for, because I got the turn. I was like, okay, it's not going to take me, but like a turn and a half to be able to get all this squared away. And so I kept asking Del, okay, well, this means this, right? Like this means this, right? This means this, right? So he knew exactly what was in my hand. So I thought that he knew exactly what I was doing. My palms are so sweaty. I'm like, at any moment, he's just going to swoop in and like pull the rug out from under me. I knew that you were going to play the card and get points, and I wasn't worried about the points. I just didn't know what exactly was needed for the automatic win, and that's my own fault. That's fair. But now we know because the Middle East scoring card does not have an auto win like that. It is not, no. But the Africa card does. It sure the hell does have that auto win. Yeah, so this game does have that. If you don't make it to the very end where you just do regional scoring like that again and the winner's the winner, then somebody can win during the middle of the game by either having their opponent trigger nuclear war, doing the Africa scoring card and meeting those requirements for instant win, or hitting 10 points because you're not keeping them down, whether it be from the space race track or whatever. And just like in the original Twilight, the score track is a tug of war. And so if Delton has five points and I gain two points, he actually just goes down by three points. I talked talked about that. Did you? Yeah, I said it was a teeter-totter. Oh. Yeah, I mean, same thing. But yes, it is just like the original, which actually leads me to a good point. So I'll let you keep it in. (laughs) That's what she said. Uh, Hey. So this game, I was like, okay, this is Twilight Struggle. It's supposed to be a lunchtime version, smaller. You know, we'll see how they... It feels just like the big Twilight Struggle. Absolutely. Aside from the two Flashpoint countries, it feels like Twilight Struggle. If you want to play Twilight Struggle, you want to try it out, and you don't want to spend the $10 on the app, you'd rather spend the money on the board game, get this version if you're not sure if you would like a, you know, anywhere from an hour and a half to a three hour big game. This version just has the identical feel, the same card play, the same strategy on just a smaller, more condensed, more compact level where the decision-making isn't so vast that you get lost with what your strategy was. And that's what I found with me that this works better than the regular. The regular Twilight Struggle, you've got Europe, you've got Eastern Europe, you've got the Middle East, you've got some Africa. I think there's some Asian countries involved. There's so much to consider at any one time. And this game just condenses and squishes it down to uh, how many countries total? 12 countries, maybe? There's only maybe 12. You've got Egypt. Uh, Let me see. Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Madagascar, Somalia, Djibouti, South Yemen, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and then there's one more in the Middle East that I can't see in the picture. And then there's the sea lanes. So it's like super, super compacted compared to the regular Twilight Struggle, which makes it so much easier to focus and say, okay, I want to do this, but my opponent's doing this. I actually have the ability to probably kind of do both things and not get distracted with 18 other things going on. Does Twilight Struggle also have stuff happening in like South America, the full version? I think it does. I think it does. I think it's a world map, isn't it? I think so. It's just so goddamn big and I can't keep track of anything. But this fixes that issue. So I'm not the biggest. I think Twilight Struggle is a fantastically designed game and I think it's very good. I'm not a huge fan of it. Because the fact of the preference that you should have is your hand is all of your opponent's events because you can let them perform those events and then you can react with your operation value actions of placing uh, your influence, performing coups or realignment roles after getting all of the information. So that's actually a big benefit for you. However, I don't ever see it that way. It always feels like it just sucks to have a handful of your opponent's cards And it sucks to have a handful of your own because you want to use their events, but then you don't get the other stuff. And it's just, it's a weird system that doesn't click necessarily for me, even though I understand why it's loved. And I do think it's well done, but I think this version for me, if Haley wants to play a Twilight Struggle, I'm going to want to pull this one out because even at its worst, it's going to take an hour. 
And at its other side of worst, it's going to take 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think for me that this one's going to win out in 99.9% .9 of situations of which one I want to play. So I know I don't get to play it too often, but Twilight Struggle is probably my favorite game of all time. Uh, not just because I'm undefeated against Delton. Um, but I agree with Delton. This is a great mini version of the game. And so if you do have a hankering to play some Twilight Struggle, if you've heard me talk mad about it over these last five or six years and you really want to give it a try but don't really want to dedicate the like 50, 60, 70 bucks to actually purchase the thing or the, you know, one to four business hours in order to actually play it, I also recommend this one too. It is an easier version. It is a quicker version. It's more, it's a fun version, but really it's the exact same game just on a smaller scale. And it not only includes solo rules, as I just said, but a huge, huge bonus, the table space this takes is a fraction of the main Twilight Struggle board. Oh, it's nothing. It's like a quarter of it because the main Twilight Struggle board is gigantic. And this is just like a little smaller than your standard board game size. And it actually has really helpful little details on either end of the board for you to look at how does a coup work exactly? And then it shows you your ops value plus the value you roll your die, minus two times the stability of, e of the region you're going for. And you're like, oh, I understand this now. So it's really well done. And setup is really quick and easy too. Yeah, setup's way faster, partially because it's simpler. Yes, absolutely. So yes, I really like this. Haley seems to really like it. I think this was a good gift purchase for, for you two, a year and a half ago. <laughs> Only like a, a year and a, a quarter. A year and a quarter, over a year ago. Uh, but yeah, this will be, if someone wants to try, tw says they've always wanted to play Twilight Struggle, but it seems too big, I will happily bust this out and play this one. 10 out of 10. Uh, one thing, before we move to the beer, so we can then get to the topic, I wanted to bring up something interesting, uh, was in the designer notes in the book, I'm just going to kind of skip around in here, but he basically says, this is so this came 16 years after the original game, and... He said he's wanted to address the omission of the Horn of Africa as a notable battlefront in the Cold War for quite some time, uh, which I thought was interesting because I had never realized this was a thing part of, you know, part of it. But he said uh, here, Twilight Struggle Red Sea maintains the approach of the original game. The only real concern for the United States in the Horn of Africa or the Saudi Peninsula is the endless competition with the USSR. And yet the actual history belies it. Is that how you say that? Belies? Bellies? B-E-L-I-E-S? I think Belize. I'm not sure. I think Belize. I don't even know what that means. In fact, both Ethiopia and Somalia were very successful in manipulating U.S. policy based on Cold War fears, but in furtherance of age-old grievances. Uh, where did I go? My brains. Meanwhile, without stretching the facts too far, it is possible to see the Soviets in the horn as good actors. They spent real political capital trying to maintain peace between the Somalis and the Ethiopians. In both South Yemen and Ethiopia, they were interested in tempting, uh, tempering the overly radical reflexes of the newly Marxist regimes. However, viewing Soviet influence as benign requires ignoring that her only contribution to the mass human starvation was more arms shipments. So he's like talking about all this history that I never realized, but it's really funny that in some of this, the Soviets actually tried to do good things in areas, but obviously it's not perfect. And he talks a lot about that. And I just found that fascinating as an area of the Cold War I didn't know was a thing and he left it out of the original game and now finally got to make it into another version. And something cool is Twilight Struggle Red Sea only has two turns, like I said, early war or mid war, late war. However, you can actually add cards from the full Twilight Struggle to have a third turn in the game to extend the game longer. Or you can add some of the cards from Red Sea into the full Twilight Struggle to add some of those elements and historical things into that game, and it talks about how to incorporate them. So I thought that was really cool as well. Absolutely, that is. Are you ready for the second beer? Let's go! Me, me, me. The first one was so good, we'll see if this one can make it uh, hold up to it. So in the past, from Marshall Brewing Company, we had had their big Jamoke coffee porter. I think I remember us really liking that, but honestly, that was a long time ago now. I don't even know when. However, this is their big Jamoke Robust Porter. Not coffee, just a standard Robust Porter. But it's from Marshall Brewing Co., which again is an Oklahoma local company. 
Uh, see if I can find some information. 6.8% alcohol by volume, 12 fluid ounces. Uh, they are out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I have never been disappointed with anything Marshall has put out. It's always been solid and delicious. The one I know the most is this land that has the yes, uh, the amber ale with the bison on it. Yeah, not the buffalo. I almost said buffalo, and I had to argue with someone. Bison are not buffalo, and buffalo are not bison. Yeah, they're their own things, even though they're both cloven hooved creatures. Contrary to popular belief, the buffalo do not roam here. Give me a home where the bison roam and the deer and the cantaloupe play. I'd say you better even that out there. Like you want more after those two Topo Chicos with dinner. <laughs> Mistakes were made. I mean, I also had two, uh, two Topo Chicos Ooh. before and during dinner. Uh, this is just one of those days because my, my back's so sore from that massage. This is a dark as night porter. It smells roasty toasty. It smells, very, I mean, it smells like a porter. It's got that super roastiness with... There, there's something in the scent of a porter I can never put my finger on. It's almost as if... And this is my best way I can put it. If you imagine that you're smelling the fresh roasted grains for beer, a lot of porters use like a black grain. That's what this smells like. If you had a grain of wheat that you roasted and then you had a grain of wheat that was like a black wheat that you roasted, this smells like that black wheat. Does that make sense? It almost smells like a rye bread. Kind of, yeah. I guess there's a difference between like rye and regular. This has a lot of that. Of course, leave it up to you to come up with something very simple and easy. <laughs> It's what I do. That's why people listen to this podcast. It's not about the board game reviews. It's about my beer reviews. Ooh, that's got a lot more bitterness than I expected. Mm. Not in a hop manner, but like a... Oh, it's, wow. It's not dry, but it's... it's. I don't know what term to use, but I would almost say bitter. It tastes like a porter, but it's... In the proper porter style, it's not sweet, but it's almost got a hint of dry, but not at the finish and not at the front. It's oddly in the middle. Like... My throat is fine. The front of my mouth is like salivating, but my tongue feels dry. It's really strange. It's just got this, uh, just, I don't know. It's that weird dryness in the middle of the drink. It's strange. It's almost the same feels whenever you have toasted rice. You ever had like toasted rice? Like rice has been cooked and it's been toasted. Rice Krispies? Yeah. I mean, yes, but (laughs) (laughs) like maybe, maybe rice has been the skillet too long. Oh, like you do every time you reheat the rice in the skillet? Yeah. Like I do every time I heat the rice in the skillet. It kind of <laughs> tastes like that where it's like, yeah. it's, it's already cooked, but it's been browned a little bit. Yep. It tastes like that. Yep, I can see that. Just a little, like if it was brown rice, though. Yeah, and just like toasted a little too long in the skillet, but tastes really good. It's good, though. Like, like, it's surprising how dry, and maybe it's because the last beer was not at all. I don't know. But it's surprising how dry that is, but that's really good, though. Like, it's a solid porter. 10 out of 10. I'm happy with that. Happy camper. Good job, Marshall. Well, with that beer cracked and deliciously going down, let's move to the topic. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. So, the topic of today's episode is demoralizing moments in board games. Delton, yeah. have you ever experienced this before? Yeah, I lost in 10 minutes into Twilight Struggle Red Sea. That was great. Felt real nice. Felt real nice. Yeah, it made me want to play it again. So, uh, whenever we were playing this, so we, we sat down to play this, what was it, Thursday night or Friday night? Friday night? Um, yeah, I guess it was last night. Yes. So we sat down to play it and with the intention to review it on this podcast. And we're hoping to at least get one game in. And we're not even, like Delta said, we're not even 10 minutes in. And I play the, the Africa scoring card and I win the game. And at that moment, I looked at Delton and I said, I'm so sorry. And he says, I don't even think I want to play anymore. <laughs> and so there was a moment where we're like, well, what are we going to do for the podcast? Because I think Delton was going to tap out of playing this game. It was, it was a moment that was definitely demoralizing. And, and it makes sense, too. Like, I kind of got lucky in that game. Like, a, it was the first time we played. And, of course, you know, the first time you play a game even – against someone who knows the rules like you got to give credit like or you got to give grace i guess yeah um but he was demoralized and he wasn't sure that he even wanted to continue and try it again we we're probably going to have to find a new a new game and so we wanted to really talk about what are some demoralizing moments we've had in games and how have we how have we navigated them so Delt, what about you what about last night tell us about your experience and what did you do to kind of navigate it hi i'm delton i'm a sore loser <laughs> Uh, my journey began in board games in 2012, and every time I lose, I hate it. No, um, 
so it's just it's one of those things I already go into any Twilight Struggle game with reservations of I'm not going to enjoy this is kind of what I begin with because I get so frustrated so easily um, with this game at least. And this one was much better. But yeah, having me not understand that rule like well enough to know that you could play it and win the game and then you playing it and winning the game. Uh, I don't know that I really navigated it aside from I don't want to have to learn something else for the podcast after spending lunchtime setting the game up and learning the rules and all. So we obviously just had to push through and play again, which luckily I won that time because I did it. So but, are you glad you did? I mean, I guess so. I'm glad I gave it another shot because I do like this game. I thought it was, uh, it makes up for a lot of the downfall of the big version for me, which is just that I can't stay focused in a game with that much open choice going on. This one helps you focus in and say, hey, these are your options. If you look too far left or right, there's no more options. So you kind of have a limited scope. It makes it easier. So I'm glad I did. Uh, but man, in those moments where something like that happens, it really is the like, I don't want to play this. I'm just going to go in there and do something else. But luckily we sat down and started playing and it felt better because I felt like I knew what I was doing and I didn't feel like I was uh, going to fall victim to that again. If you would have somehow pulled it off again, it would have been would have been because you just severely outplayed me rather than me not understanding how you could win it and whatnot. So I felt better. Good. But it just it just took really the podcast needing to be done for me to sit down and go, fine, let's go, t- n- t- do it again, run it back. Well, now we put you through the ringer. I think we should put me through the ringer when it comes to demoralizing games and how I am my own worst enemy when it comes to cryptid. You are! So 10 out of every five times we play cryptid, I end up tanking the game due to my own dumbass self. Yeah, it's not that you tank the game, you just break it. I just break it. (laughs) Every single... Okay, there's been like two or three times we played where I haven't like shot myself in the foot and ruined the game for everybody, but I always, always, always seem to misunderstand my rule or get like the most wonky ass rule in the entire game and misread it, misunderstand it, not really know how it actually is executed or forget which one I have. I'm thinking back to the rule that I had the last game. And so every single time I feel absolutely crushed and demoralized because I'm like, I didn't just ruin this experience for myself. I just threw the last 47 minutes away for all of my teammates. So if you're unaware, Cryptid is a game from Osprey that we like a lot. Uh, Cryptid is a game where you have a rule that's essentially, I was going to say it's a negative, but it's not. It can be. You have a rule such as uh, within two spaces of a mountain. Cool. The the hex grid board has different landscapes, basically, in each hex. So within two spaces of a mountain, which can also mean on the mountain, within two spaces of a mountain is going to be the answer for you. Everybody has a clue like that. Within two spaces of a mountain, uh, no more than one space away from a swamp, on a water tile, whatever. Somewhere on the board, all of the player's clues are going to combine on one tile and one tile only. So your job is to figure out everybody else's clues based on them saying no. Uh, basically, you asking, is, could this be it? And them saying yes or no. Or them saying, I'm going to give information. I, I'm guessing that it's this. And they're saying, yes, this works for my clue. Is that the answer? And everyone has to say yes or no until someone says no. So Haley is really bad about saying, uh, basically someone says, is this good or not? And Haley is like, no, not good. Or yes, that's good. Oh, I'm sorry. That should actually be no. Or no, that's good. Yes, I'm sorry. It should actually be yes. Or Haley going, I'm going to guess, is it this one? And everyone says yes or no or whatever. And then Haley goes, oh, actually, no, I'm sorry. That's not it. That has to be a no. And the problem is that's so much information in the game that it just breaks it. And it's the only problem with this game that I warn everyone is that it's fragile. One person, which is always Haley, I'm so sorry, (laughs) one person giving away that extra piece of information really can just immediately give away the answer to everyone else. So it's a very fragile game. We really like it, but Haley does that every single time we play. And so I think this is the key difference between you and me is that, you know, you got demoralized in Twilight Struggle and you're like, I just want to not play. I get demoralized and cryptid and I'm like, 
I'm going to ruin everybody's time again and let's say, let's play it again, y'all. Let's go. Yeah, you're like, we have to try it again. I'm so sorry. And then just like the last time we did that, <laughs> immediately messed it up like super <laughs> early. I'm just, I'm just going to try so hard to... To, to get it right, I'm just going to ruin everybody's time for the next three rounds, but it's fine. I just need to make sure that you get a negative goal so it's like it cannot be on a water space because that would be so much easier. See, if I got something like that, cannot be a water space with and not like within two of a hunk of dunk a dunk or whatever. <laughs> a hunk of dunk a dunk. <laughs> I hunk of dunk a dunk in your hunk of dunk a trunk. <laughs> we barely play with more than just you and I, so like we haven't played that in forever. And so I, I can't remember what all the little figurines are around the board but if i could just be like not on a water space dope i got it but i always get the obscure ones it's like not within 3.4 spaces away from a campground i'm like i don't know how to count it's you and me and marjorie and we're living together (laughs) with penny kitty there you go there's our song I don't know where that came from, but I love it. You said playing with you and me. Oh, you and, and me. And then yeah. I was like, you and me and Marge, you make three. And I was like thinking of stuff in my head. I think that's beautiful. Thanks. Oh, that was my ringtone. Sure. I'm but not- speaking of ruining everyone else's time. Oh, ruining everybody else's time? Or do you want me to talk about the time that my time was ruined for like three hours? Oh, you want to talk about that first? I do, Tyler. <laughs> uh, I hope Tyler listens to this. I should yell at him. Um, so... I talked about this before. We played at BGG Con in 2023 uh, a big board game called Station Fall that a lot of people really enjoy. Uh, so it's a game where you have two characters, one of which you pick as your like, I'm going to be this character as my main goal that has goals I can achieve on it to get points. The other character is a, if something happens to my first character, I can decide to swap to this one instead. Well, uh, essentially anybody can control anybody but you have to play some influence markers. I didn't like that. Uh, But basically you could control anybody and move them on the board. So if you've ever played Mr. Jack, it reminded me of Mr. Jack, but super complicated. Mr. Jack is, is it one person's definitely Jack the Ripper? Yeah. One person's definitely Jack the Ripper and one person's not. But the person that's Jack the Ripper is allowed to control everyone on the board as, as are you. But one of those people is actually Jack the Ripper, and you don't know which one, but they do. But they can still control all the good guys, and you have to figure out who they're controlling where and which one's actually Jack the Ripper. Uh, Mr. Jack's a very good game, I think. Station Fall is kind of like that, where everyone controls everyone, and everyone's trying to win, but they don't want to give away who their character is because you could straight up kill that character. Well, I had a character that was this person on board. My other character was a rat that had telepathic abilities because sci-fi game. So my character was carrying the rat because the rat can't do anything on his own. He's got to be being carried by somebody to, for, to then control that person to do human stuff because they have human hands and feet and can, you know, do things. I say human. I guess there's like a robot and whatever else in that game. But essentially, my one character that was not my main one was holding the rat, who was my main one I was going for. And I'm like, I'm going to tell this guy to do this and this, and I'm going to start going toward my goal as fast as possible to see if I can just get off the ship or whatever. Well, then I'm like, you know what? I got to pee. We've gone around the table like two times. Everyone's figuring this out. We're all pretty much new players, I think, except Tyler. I'm going to get up and go pee. Get up and go pee. I come back. My person was eaten by Haley and her plant, her like herb, herb, herbologist. Botanist? Whatever the stupid botanist, there you go. The botanist, the botanist had like that looked a, like you. He sure he had like a plant, like a uh the the plant from Mario. I can't I don't know why I can't think of it or a pitcher plant or something that like can eat people. So Haley ate my character, but little did they know they ate my character and they ate my second character. So from like turn three, which was twenty thirty minutes into this game because we're all brand new of this three or four hour game. I had zero capability of earning a single point the entire game. That was so dumb. So (laughs) I just had to control other people's characters and the ones that weren't being controlled and run around and do stupid stuff. At one point, I gave the monkey a gun (laughs) and I was going to have the monkey (laughs) shoot the escape pod while it was in it, which would blow up the escape pod and kill the monkey. And I was like, nah, I won't do that. I'll just make the monkey leave the escape pod. Well, then 
the person controlling the monkey got back in the escape pod and launched it and ended up winning the game because their goal was to get the monkey to escape the ship and they got bonus points if they had a gun. And I was like, I don't understand <laughs> what's happening. I was so frustrated with that play because I had not a single opportunity to earn a point at all. And the winner only won with like five points. They're so small, like the point ranges. So that was very frustrating for me. And it's why I have not tried that game again. Um, there's things about it I really liked. There are several things I really did not like. That being one of them, that I couldn't re-roll and just get a new character or something. But uh, that was Haley's fault. Long Hi. story short, Haley ate me, and it was bad. He was delicious. It was basically the plant from Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah. Randolph. Audrey. Sure. Seymour. <laughs> That's the name I'm thinking of. Is that what the plant says? Is that the yeah. guy's name? Yeah. What's that actor? He was from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, right? I don't remember. I mean, same guy, though, right? I don't remember. Oh, hold I've on. I've seen the play. I don't remember the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? No, Little Shop of Horrors. Oh. Well, damn it, Haley. <laughs> I'm cultured, damn it. I don't believe that. His name is, yeah, Rick Moranis. Nice. He was in Spaceballs as uh, the guy with the big helmet playing the uh, Darth Vader looking dude. Mm -hmm. And he was in Ghostbusters at some point. But more importantly, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Look at that. Wasn't he the one that quit acting to take care of his wife when she got sick? I have no idea. I think that's correct. Very, very sad but sweet thing. But anyway, we have one more situation to talk about before we wrap this episode up. <laughs> yeah, so this reminds me of every time I crash cryptid because... It's me ruining everybody else's time, and another time we ruined everyone else's time was whenever we tried to introduce our good friends Zach and Sarah to Pandemic, and we talked it up like, yeah, this is such a great game, it's easy, we're all going to get into it, we all work together, like, don't worry, friend who's never played this before and who's nervous about ruining it, like, no, we're all going to help each other, we're all on the same team. We draw a card, bam, draw a card, bam, draw a card, bam, draw a card, bam, and guess what, Delton, what happens? So we open, we get pandemic going. Turn one, we do some stuff. Turn two, game over. I didn't think it was possible, but based on like the very specific initial cards that came out and then how quickly we drew the actual like pandemic card or whatever, the game ended on like turn two. And I think we just packed it up and said, we'll pick something different. <laughs> it, and nobody was like wait what this happens i was like i've never seen it in this early i didn't know that was possible we were so deflated yes it deflated everybody's interest in playing that game and honestly i don't know that i've played it since aside from uh at nick and jennifer's well two months later the pandemic started so that's a little true. too soon that's true uh but yeah those are some some big stories i guess probably too long to tell you uh, but we told you a lot of long stories about being demoralized in games, and I'm sure we've all been there. You should totally email us uh, or message us on Twitter or Instagram or something uh, if you have any great stories like that where you just have either ruined someone's evening or yours was ruined in the process. Um, contact at malthousegames.com for the email or find us at Malthouse Games on social media and let us know because that's always a fun topic. Yes, and tell us again how you get through it too because if you're like me... We're just going to try, try again, despite how everyone else's time is going. Yes. But we have one more thing to do before this episode is finished, which is talk about Valentine's Day. Battle and Blinds Day. And now, join us for a Malt House Games podcast special, My Size Question. Before we talk about Happy Valentine's Day things and our question of the episode, uh, I was correct. Rick Moranis. In 1997, took a break from acting uh, because he was a widower. Oh, man. Dedicate his time to his two children uh, after, I believe, his wife had passed away because she was sick. He has not appeared in a live action film for over 25 years. since really? Since 97. Although he provided voiceover work for a few animated films. In 2020, after a hiatus of nearly 23 years from live action, he signed to appear in a new sequel to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids called Shrunk, stupid. However, as of 2024, it has yet to proceed to filming. He is 70. Wow. But uh, yeah, she, oh, she died in 91. I'm sorry. She died in 91, and in 97, he stopped to spend straight up time with his kids. Uh, yeah, very sweet thing to do, very sad uh, thing. But I remember reading about that, and I was like, that's why we haven't seen him in ages is because he was just doing family stuff. So I'm sure that movie is probably stuck in development hell. Props to him. 
that a uh, shrunk movie with uh, the pandemic. Yeah, and they, yeah, they never started filming it, so that's Man. crazy. However, the original Honey I Shrunk the Kids was a huge hit in my household when I was young. Oh yeah, we watched that so much. I remember them riding on the ants. Oh yeah, I remember that potassium helps with blood clots. So eat a banana. No, it wasn't blood clots. It was uh, didn't he faint? Yeah, it was faint. Yeah. So eat a banana for potassium. Yeah. Even though the potassium level in a banana is so small <laughs> for something like but that, I remember in my understanding. That. Is that from that movie? Yeah. Okay. I also remember that scene because they're like, here, get a banana. And they open it and like shove a piece in his mouth. And I'm like, if he's passing out, he's not going to be able to eat that banana. <laughs> That's a complex carbohydrate, sir. That was really funny. But yes, I remember that scene too vividly. For some reason, that's stuck in my head. Someone passes out, force feed him a banana. Everything will be fine. But anyway, what Valentine's gift did you give me, Haley? I gave Dalton a dozen roses made out of Legos. Yeah, boy, she gave me the Lego rose bouquet. And he had to put it together himself. Yep, she not only gave me a gift, but an activity. I gave him the gift of two hours of Legos. Yep, she gave me the big, full, 12-rose bouquet Lego set. Uh, looks really nice in the red vase on the mantle right now. Uh, very nice little Legos. I like them because you could tell that some of the pieces are like custom. I don't know if they were always rose pieces, but they look like custom flower pieces. And the way you put them together is just really neat. So I liked it. So that was really cool. You know what I got Haley? I, I got, got Haley a porch goose. I got a porch goose named Ron. By God, by God. If you have never seen a porch goose, you are missing out, my friends. A porch goose is a goose that lives on your porch. He might be named Ron. He might be named something else. But you buy him festive little outfits to change into every once in a while. So that way he can be snazzy as he greets the folks who come to your door to tell you about Jesus. So a porch goose, you can go to Miles Kimball is the website. They have porch geese from Gaggleville is the company or whatever. <laughs> I know it's so dumb. Uh, but it's literally like this plastic goose that you can put a little sand or water in the base and it sits on your porch and then they sell outfits. And I bought Haley the raincoat one that the neighbor down the street has. And I also bought her one that is like a Hawaiian shirt with a lei and a little like straw hat. So when we go to Hawaii, he can also be on vacation with us. He was. And so I want to get him. He also has a little, there's a, a camping or a hiking outfit that you can get him. He also has a like red cardinal you can dress him in. And the possibilities are endless. I am incredibly excited. Delton basically knows what to get me for every major holiday between now and the end of time. Just get Ron a little outfit for him. For his little poot, uh, porch wear. <laughs> his little poot wear? His little poot wear. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is I really just bought myself an out on every holiday. I'm like, look, I got your goose and outfit. Yes. And I don't have to actually put thought in anymore? Yep. Oh, man, I can save so much money. Yep. I'm going to buy you 37,000 outfits, though. It's going to be a problem. Everybody wins. Except for the one that's the corn on the cob because it's, as Jennifer put, Slightly phallic. That's a little phallic. <laughs> it's a little strange. But at the end of the day, Delton got a dozen roses for Valentine's Day, and I just got goosed. You did get goosed. I got goosed. I got roses I had to put together, and you got goosed. <laughs> Everything's fine. Everything's fine. But I think that's going to do it for this episode of the Maltas Games Podcast. I should have said episode 164. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to our amazing Patreon patrons, Alan, Jennifer, and Cliff. Thank you so much for supporting us on Patreon at the level in which you get shouted out on the podcast. And thanks to all our other amazing patrons. If you want to be like them, you can go to patreon.com slash malthouse games. If you want to send us an email, either telling us your demoralizing gaming moment, talking about a game you think we should find to review, a topic you want us to cover, or a question we should answer, maybe even a beer we should find, contact at malthousegames.com is where you can send the email, or you can reach out on social media at Malthouse Games. You can also find Haley at S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-Y-G-E-K. That is at Squirrely Geek. I think that that does it. We're going to go hiking tomorrow, see my mom tomorrow, go see my brother's house that he's been building. Bring him some beer. Take him some beer and just say hi. Uh, but that's really the plan for tomorrow. So hopefully I can get this edited tonight or early, early in the morning. <laughs> I'm preferring early in the morning right now because uh... I want dessert and I'm sleepy. I need boy. some ibuprofen for my back because that massage. Oh, God, I'm pretty sure I'm bruised. Need a massage for your massage? I kind of feel like it, yes. But I think that's all of it. Thank you again so much for tuning in and listening. Until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. We'll see you folks later. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.